Demos, and welcome to another episode of the Pro Hockey Pod, episode 52. Um, for those wondering, uh, we took a bit of a break there. We were very busy with uh, pre-playoffs and playoffs playing every other day, so it was kind of hectic to get in an episode. But uh, unfortunately, our season ended uh, in the quarterfinals there, but now a little more time with the players going home next week and stuff, so just been wrapping that up. But happy to be back, hopefully be grinding out a couple more uh, throughout the next few weeks here before I head back to Canada. But um, this week, pretty excited to have this guy on. It's someone a little different. Um, someone not who was a player before, someone not from the hockey side, has a very interesting background, um, was actually involved in other sport, and now, you know, is our video coach. And uh, I have to say, probably one of the best video coaches uh, I've worked with in my career. So happy to hear his story, how he got involved in it. And, uh, you know, where he sees his career going. But uh, welcome to the podcast, Florian Kynes. Hello, hello, hello. You're all ner- he's all nervous, as most of the, as most of the Germans are. Uh, he was telling me before that uh, he wasn't sure how much of his uh, early childhood stuff and he was going to remember, so he had to make some notes. But we'll see how it goes. It's pretty easy flow. Don't worry. You can relax. But um, we always take it back to kind of, you know, your childhood there. So you were born in... Worms, Germany, or as we say in German, Worms, Germany, I believe, you know, the W's or V's here. Um, what's kind of the earliest uh, memory of your childhood you have from there? Well, um, yeah, I, I was born in Worms, so, um, but I grew up in, in a little town called uh, Bürstadt. Um, we prob- probably got maybe one, two celebrities from there that are just known in Germany. So. Uh, it's not a famous town, not a big town. Um, yeah, what were my childhood memories? Like, I think typical for, for Germans, like you come home from school or probably early and more back to the days uh, where I was in the kindergarten, like you come home, you go outside with your friends, you play outside on the street, you go to the fields, you go to some soccer spots to, to uh, play soccer, like that's the the earliest childhood memories i mean nowadays all the little kids are sitting at home uh, playing playstation sitting in front of their mobile phones their tablets like we we don't have that so um we spend a lot of times outside playing there and we were probably able to to organize everything without having whatsapp or looking who is where and all that stuff so that that's probably the the nicest thing to remember back and it was like if you come home and your pants weren't dirty like the mom said you go out again and you just come back home when your pants are dirty like that that was a nice childhood yeah no you're you definitely made a good point there i remember you know coming home from school kind of like yourself and it was uh with your group of friends what are we doing are we playing road hockey are we playing soccer are we playing basketball we were going in the forest as you said getting all dirty there's a famous uh i wouldn't say famous but there's a really cool photo a lot of people post on social media and it's the picture of like the bikes in the out front on the driveway and it's like this is back then how you knew where everyone was like as you said it wasn't on whatsapp or snapchat or anything it was you know we're going to meet up here and here's the time or you were calling everybody's house and hoping the person was there but uh no it, pretty cool to see that it was kind of a similar childhood um for you yeah it, it, it was like um just you know okay we let's say we meet at two o'clock you know okay i need 15 minutes mm-hmm. to the spot where we meet so you know i ha- i have to leave my home at this time and it was pretty funny like especially in summer you knew for example, the street lights are turning on at six o'clock, so you know the street lights are your clock. So when they get getting turned on, you have to leave to be at home at the right time. So yeah. that was pretty funny. Yeah. The good old days. Um, always curious talking to uh to to Germans, kind of what drew you originally to the sport of hockey? Um, because obviously Germany is known for being a soccer football. Uh, country obviously ice hockey isn't uh, isn't sport number one here so I'm always curious like what kind of drew you to the sport of hockey um it was pretty funny like um when when I was young I always wanted to go to games at the at the old rink and it was pretty cold there and my father was kind of against hockey 
you always said it's scripted like what kind of sport is this that you play four times against the team in one season and uh then you play against them another probably four times or seven times in playoffs like at least you play 12 times against one team in one season like he said that's all scripted so he was probably against it and then once they like an old friend of mine said oh, i got a ticket left do you want to join me and it was pretty funny so my first game i visit was mannheim against frankfurt and it was here at the sap arena and it catched me up like directly the emotions the passion um like the, the sport how fast it is the intensity on the ice and also yeah as i said like probably that's a point where we come later on also like standing in the stands there and cheering for the team that mm -hmm. that was like yeah it's it's like a flu if you want gets infected yeah like it, it packs you no it's very true and you're right we will get that get to that later but it's always cool to hear uh kind of what draws people first to to the sport um you know we Germans, it's very popular for you to play uh, like soccer growing up. I'm going to say soccer for this whole podcast because we have a lot of North American people listening. Obviously, it's football here um, and the real football, I would say, because you do use your feet. But um, what other sports did you play growing up as a as a kid? Yeah, it was pretty funny. Like I started to play one year in handball because my, my father was um, an amateur handball player. So... That was the nearest one and uh yeah then he explained me a couple of things i have to do and i was so confused and i said "Fuck, that's too complicated for me so um sorry for my language um so i said i i want to do something that's probably easier so i went over uh, to soccer and i played soccer then for 16 years And that are probably the, the only two sports I did in a, in a sports club. I guess you also do sports at school and in your free time when you meet with your friends, like basketball was kind of a sport we did. And then, yeah, when we were in age like 10, 12, where you or where some people get picked up to hockey, we started like to play street hockey mm -hmm. um, without roller skates, just running around, having the stick in your hand. And that was pretty funny. And that are the sports, yeah, you do in your free time, like mm -hmm. table tennis and, and all that stuff. Yeah, there's definitely only so many as kids you do as a group. I think you just basically name them all. Um, it's cool to see the similarities, obviously, being from two different completely... Uh, countries but um we talked about this kind of outside when we were walking up and you were nervous of how to explain it but you know as i said you grew up playing uh football and we were talking about the minor the minor structures sorry the minor organization structures i should say i was going to say minor hockey but um for this region here this kind of area like what is it what is the structure for for soccer players when they're coming up through the youth um Now it's pretty funny that you talk about the the region here. Yeah, like every every state in in Germany is having his own association, you could say. Um, I don't know how it is up here in Baden-Württemberg because I probably come from Hessen, mm -hmm. so I know how it is there. Um, yeah, like you you start with the little kids and then it goes up until you are 18. So from 18 on, you are allowed to play with the senior teams and yeah you also have leagues um i think in hessen at my time when i played there were one two three four like five leagues you have to run through and if you are playing at the highest league you had to be the first place and then you played kind of a relegation round to go up to the youth bundesliga mm -hmm where you dare probably play against the youth teams from the well-known big Bundesliga clubs like Bayern Munich, um, Frankfurt, Leverkusen, like from all the big clubs um, you played against these teams. And yeah, that's kind of the, the structure in, in youth soccer. And it's like you, you have a lot of youth teams. Um, and 
it's like the big teams like Hoffenheim, probably that's one of the well-known teams in our region here. Also the Mannheim team that plays with their senior team in the third league uh, in Germany. Like they they have, or they go to coaches at the little clubs and tell them like, okay, hey, we want to make a cooperation with your club. And as soon as there is a, a good young player that could be interesting for us, like let us know. Mm -hmm. We are the first team you let know before, for example, you let know Kaiserslautern, mm -hmm. Hoffenheim or something like that. They they call it like Star Club. So it's it's like um, a program where they said, yeah, we want to get the talents out from the little clubs and want to help them to to grow as a Bundesliga soccer player or pro soccer player. I think they do that well. You know, you target those those young athletes at a young age, and then you can kind of keep your eye on them. Um, you know, obviously their structures of how they do it, I think, have been known to have good effect, and I think that's why they continue to produce uh, lots of good players. One thing I want to ask you too, um, I've only known this because of the pictures that you you were showing us in the dressing room one day. But you were uh, <laughs> when you played when you played football, soccer there. You were a a goalkeeper, a keeper. Um, I'm curious, uh, like what made you become a keeper? Uh, I feel like the answer might be a little obvious, but. I know that you were waiting for the question. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the answer is pretty similar, uh, simple. Like, yeah, to be honest, I was too lazy to run. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up as a goalie. Um, but I also have to say, like, even as a, as a goalie, you, you need a good condition. Like. Mm -hmm. My role model at this time was uh, the well-known German national keeper, Oliver Kahn. And he had games where he probably had two or three shots on the net, but he was sweat after the game yeah. just because of being focused and staying in the game because he knew, yeah, that's a game where I probably get three shots on net, but that are the shots that I have to keep or to save. And yeah. So also as a goalie, you needed a good condition yeah. and and uh, to be focused. I found that out the hard way too. I think one of the reasons I became a goalie in hockey was um, I had asthma as a kid. So I was like, you know what? I'm sick of throwing up after every shift of going too hard. So I'm going to be a goalie. And then you realize that you have to move with heavy equipment on. You're you know, going up and down. You would be jumping all around, like constantly moving around. And you have a, obviously a way bigger crease, way bigger net to guard than you do in hockey. But it's still, uh, you know, for anyone who thinks, you know, goalkeeper is just the easy way out, um, you're sadly mistaken because they actually are probably on most teams, you know, one of the best guys in shape because of just everything else they have to do and worry about. And as you said, in, in football, you might get one shot a game, you might get two, and you got to be ready for those shots because it could be the the difference maker too, right? Yeah, it's it's like you... You also see it now in, in some hockey games, especially in, in playoffs. You you have games where teams are having 40 shots on that and they probably score one goal. Mm -hmm. And the other team is just having like 20 shots on that, but they score five goals. So, yeah, you, you have to be focused and you have to stay in the game. And that's why you need that good um, condition. And it's also maybe something... I want to get on it um, to have in, in our job, in our business as a video coach. Like you have to be focused 60 minutes just watching at the little screen, watching the game there, what's going on, mm -hmm. what's happening. So you also, in my opinion, need a good condition um, to, to stay focused there the whole time that you don't miss any situation that could be maybe um, the game changer. No, you're, you're hundred percent correct. And, I have a little experience doing it too. And one thing I will say is you need to have really good control of like your nerves as well, because there's a chance that something could happen and you know, you click the wrong button or maybe something technical happens and you gotta be able to, you know, remain calm and also like be able to do things on the fly without kind of jeopardizing your work. So it's, it's, I tell the people all the time, like, you know, video coaches are just as important as, as, as real coaches. It's, a different type of coaching, a different a different type of job, but it still can be very stressful at times. Obviously, I've seen the hours you put in, um, a lot of late nights, but 
Before we get to that side of it, I still want to focus on kind of your childhood there, the kind of upbringing with soccer as well. Um, we're going to skip the difference part. I had a, those questions, but I think it's kind of obvious with some of them. But um, I'm curious. So when you're a football soccer player in Germany coming up, like when do players decide, hey, I want to I want to transition to the pro game or maybe some of them, you know, say, hey, actually, I I might want to go to school, whether it's here in Germany or in Europe or maybe it's in North America, because obviously, you know, like in hockey, a lot of kids or young athletes have to make decisions at a certain age. Hey, what route am I going to go? And the reasons, you know, the pros and cons to each. I think um, that a lot of the kids that are really talented, that that's just what I can talk about. Like I, I played in small clubs in, in our towns. Um, so if you were a talented guy, then probably the big mm -hmm. clubs came to you and talked to the parents or talked to the kid. And then you, you made the decision like, okay, I want to try it or I don't want to try it. Um, but you also have to think about what is the price you want to pay for it. Like, I know guys that they said, like, I want to be a pro guy, but they were really bad in school because they were like coming home getting their sports back and then they drive to the mm -hmm. club they had to drive there like two hours two and a half and um they probably made it they played kind of third league games they played in the youth national team but when when the career is over like you you don't play soccer at the pro level also like hockey until you are 50 60. Mm -hmm. And especially if you just play the third league, probably you make money, but not enough that you can say with 35 years, okay, now I'm done. I I don't have to make anything in my life mm -hmm. again. I, I just can live my life now. So um, when they are done, like then probably the problems are starting. Like, what am I doing now? And yeah. That's that's probably something that the parents have to think about. What what is the price my child is paying later on if if he don't makes it as a pro? It it doesn't matter what sport. I tell people this all the time. Um, you you raise the point very well. As as much as we wish we could play until we're forty and make millions and millions of dollars and never have to do anything after, it's it's only the real exceptional athletes or the fortunate ones as well that get that opportunity. So. Uh, you know, whether it's 30, um, whether it's 35, you know, there is another, another door that opens when your pro career closes and you have to have a plan for that. But it's, it sounds like it's pretty, pretty similar in deciding whether it's in football or, or hockey, um, back to your career there. Um, you mentioned to me, you corrected me, but you said, uh, you played a bit of amateur football as well, or as I like to call it like semi-pro, which obviously I've done as a hockey player as well. Like you, get paid a little bit then you're also work doing something on the side um where did you do that and for how long did you do that so in totally i played soccer for 16 years and there were a couple of years they they were awesome like i still got contact with the guys there um, i got a former um goalkeeper colleague he he's now running some hotels in munich mm -hmm. and every time we play down there i write him and and we meet up and now where our season is over, I take the time to visit some guys. Um, it's pretty funny to go. Um, you probably call it to to some beer league games on on Sunday afternoon. Um, I mean, it's it's such a fun to to go to the games there. Yeah. So I played for sixteen years, um, and I played. Yeah, like I said, small towns around my hometown, and yeah. Then I ended up because I also um, had some healthy issues. And then I also thought about like, if I want to do that for a couple of more years, mm -hmm. like I had to think driving to a game, like you meet up on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, you play at one o'clock or two o'clock. So you meet at 11 o'clock, then you had to drive like one hour. Um, to to the road game then you were there you watch some a game before 
Then you go to the locker room, you change, you warm up, you play the game, you probably lose the game. That makes you frustrating. And then you have to drive that one hour back. And if you come home, like the whole Sunday is gone. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, um, is that something I want to do for nothing? Like, or just for a case of beer? Mm -hmm. that, that was that was the thing we get for when a case of beer, like, is that what I want to do for, for the rest of my soccer career? Mm -hmm. Or is there something that I'm more happy with? which ended up in going to hockey games, watching hockey, yeah. meeting friends. And that was more fulfilling my, my life than playing soccer and getting injured or losing games and get nothing for it. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes a hard decision. As much as you really like doing something, eventually it's you know got to be worth the time. And as you said, wh whatever sport you're in, you're giving up a lot of uh, personal time, You know, whether it's weekends, uh, you know, time after school to do sports and, and all that and where you could be hanging out with friends or doing other things. So it's obviously the kind of risk reward there. Um, I know before you came to this side of the, the sport world here in Mannheim that you were, I believe, working as a, an electrician. Um, like, did you did you go to school before that? And then you do kind of like a, an apprenticeship and then you start um working full-time like how did that kind of go for you yeah so i i did the normal way um i went 10 years to school that's probably the normal way you do it and after that i was not sure if i should start an apprenticeship or not so i did two more years um of school which gave me the chance to study if i want um but then i said okay i i have to make money i have to earn mm -hmm. money so I started an apprenticeship at a well-known world company um, as an electrician. But after one and a half years, I, I built up an allergy. Is that Al right? Allergy? Yeah. yeah. So I, I had to stop that, but they were pretty nice there and gave me another chance um, to make an apprenticeship as an industrial clerk. So I did that for two and a half years. I, I could run that really fast. And... Yeah, then then I started to work in the office, like normal full time job, mm -hmm. um, five days in in a week, and yeah, that that was my job before. I can tell you, it was very boring. <laughs> normal normal work world. Um, yeah, hopefully the there's a little bit of noise going on right now. We're kind of in the middle of the arena with the, this cool background, so hopefully it's not too uh, noticeable. Sorry for the listeners out there, um, but. Going forward here, um, you know, it's it's very clear for people who know you, you are a, as we say in English, a diehard fan of this team. Like you, you bleed blue, red, and white, um, and for good reason. But um, kind of kind of curious. Before you got into working for the team, like what was a what was a normal uh, game day routine for for a Mannheim fan? For maybe people listening who you know have never been to Europe and seen the, kind of the the craziness of the the atmosphere is the fan support we get over here like what was kind of like a, a normal game day for you yeah it's pretty funny so when i went to school i probably had a little bit more time to get prepared for the games uh, if you know what i mean um no it was pretty funny um we went up here to to Mannheim by train so we go by train and um yeah the train stops at two or three stations in between. So we meet up people there, friends, then you go somewhere, drink a little bit, uh, talk together, have a chat together. Then you together, you, you went to the um, tram, mm -hmm. if, if it's the right word. You go to the rink then and you meet another lot of people in front of the rink. Like it's here, not that you arrive at the rink and you directly go in there and watch the game and then you go mm -hmm. home. It's really like you meet one hour, one and a half hour before the rink opens, yeah. opens up and you talk before it. You, you have, you drink something together and then you walk in, you go to your spot, you are waiting that the lights are going out and then it starts like you stand there, you already cheer. And as soon as the lights are going out for the pregame show, um, especially in the first years when I came to Mannheim to to watch hockey, like 
it's not that you get goosebumps and you were waiting um, that the eagle is doing his his scream and yeah you you were getting checked really and it was a lot of fun it was a funny time meet up a lot of people meet good friends but yeah, as soon as i started the job mm. like there, there's coming the the other side of the metal like they said okay now you are down there in the locker room and yeah lost lost a couple of friendships but that's how it is no and i think it's really cool just to talk about that um for anyone who's never been to a european um ice hockey game in, in the higher leagues like it's literally you know i compared to back home when when i go to a leaf game for example you know you show up to the game and you're trying to get there maybe before like warm-up starts and then you're getting your food or whatever going in your seats like the guy they're on the ice for warm-ups like it's probably a quarter full you know it's so different in europe like these fans at least in my experience for here in Mannheim like these fans like if we have a game at 7 30 they're already lining up at 4 4 30 just outside the rink and the rink doesn't open for another hour and a half two hours and they're waiting you know they've probably been somewhere before having some drinks or they're coming straight from work depending on the day you know then you get they get in the rink and it's you can feel a buzz you can hear it like they're setting up there whether it's the drums the, the flags the banners um you know so when the players come out for warm-up you know, so 40 minutes before the, before the game, the full fan section, you know, the diehard fans, I'll say, so the, the people who have dressed up in jerseys, you know, painted their faces with the drums, everything I said, like it's packed and they're cheering when you come on the ice, they're booing when the away team comes on the ice. It's just, it reminds me of college, but to another degree in terms of the atmosphere. And it's just, you know, you have a lot of respect for those people. They come to every game, they spend their own money to, drive to away games some of them are five hours away and they got to work the next day like they're spending their own money to go there to cheer and you know even if your team doesn't perform well they've still shown you that they were supporting you so it's it's something pretty crazy and it's cool that you could comment on that um you were able to also bring up that you eventually uh transitioned i would say to the to the working world and here in Mannheim. so i'm just curious like you know, how did that opportunity kind of come up for you? Like, was it something that you had always been interested in doing video coaching or was it just kind of a, a random opportunity? Um, it's pretty funny. Before I started it, um, I was for one or one and a half year, like the announcer at the under 20 team. So I did the announcement at the ring there. Like I tried to be professional with music and when the guys are skating on the ice or guys getting a penalty having different musics mm -hmm. and then i was talking to the team manager i said i'm not happy with my, my my job at the office and i just want to ask him if there's something online just for pro sports to get a job in pro sports and he said let let me figure out something and then it was like being at the right spot at the right time so i had a little bit of luck but also saying that it's like when I got the opportunity, I took the opportunity. It was not like that. I said then, okay, I take I took the opportunity, and now I'm in here. No, it was like they said, okay, show us that mm. you want to do it. So I start directly after the first game. I did. I grabbed the laptop home with me, looked on the internet, like um, what software are we using? How is the software working? What what are we needing uh, on the laptops for specification and all that stuff? Like I really worked myself into it and that was getting uh, rewarded with doing that job for Mannheim now for over six years, going into my seventh season um, next year. And I think, yeah, it always sounds a little bit dumb and silly, but it shows that if you work hard for something that you want to do, that you are getting rewarded for it. I 100% agree. I always tell people, doesn't matter what you're doing, sports, not sports. Um, I think good things happen to good people. And I think if you're a hard worker, you'll be rewarded for your your work ethic and your constant uh, contribution to whatever you're doing. Um, were you nervous at all that first season? Obviously, you know, you've been fans of this team. It's a it's a big club in Germany. And then, you you know, you're now you're in the dressing room in the coach's room. Like, were you, were you nervous at all or was it okay? Yeah. So first it, it was pretty easy to tech things like, um, 
the coaches at this time, it was Pavel Groß, who is well known in, in German hockey and also in European hockey. So we first started with easy things like tech goals and tech mm -hmm. chances for and against. But when it comes more and more to, to hockey specific stuff, I was getting kind of nervous. Like, did I take the right thing? Was, was that the right situation? But like, they give me a lot of self-confidence and they also took their time to sit down with me and to run over some clips and, and teach me how to read a hockey game. And I'm very thankful for that. And um, yeah, as I said, I also took the summers um, to to read some books and all that stuff to to get myself more in into hockey. No, it's good to good to hear that. That's kind of how it went for you, and that uh, you weren't too nervous starting. Because obviously, as I said, it's uh, you have to really be able to do things on the fly in that job. And if anything goes wrong you know, you got to fix it fast because the coaches, you know, whether it's every period, uh, after every game, they need the video obviously to prepare for their, for the next game and stuff like that and correct things. Um, the first year you start, I believe, if my research is uh, correct, you end up winning the championship. Um, I'm just curious for you, you know, as I mentioned multiple times, being a, a diehard fan of this team and now becoming part of the team, and winning the championship, especially in your first season, like, you know, that must have felt just just awesome for you. Yeah, it, it was an incredible feeling. Um, I, w I will never forget that. Um, it's also like when somebody asks you how we scored that overtime goal, I still can tell you who was skating where on the ice. I still have it in front of my eyes. And the funny thing of it is, Probably if there are some guys listening to it that also doing the video, uh, that live tagging, they know that there's a delay to what's happening on the ice and what's going on your screen. And the funny thing was all the scratched guys, injured guys, they were watching the game in the gym. And I don't know why, but the gym, so the game on the TV in the gym was in front of my live tagging. So the guys were dressed up with their skates. We scored the goal. They were running out. And I was just screaming out of the coach's office, like, why, why are you guys are running out? And I just hear our former captain screaming at me, Flo, we did it. We won it. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then I was watching my screen. And then the guy, uh, Thomas Larkin, scored the goal. And I was like, holy, we won the title. So I was running out. And it, it was unbelievable. I will never forget that. But it's also like um, Play of Us mentioned it in a different podcast, like Matthias Brachter. He said, um, the, the first time you win the championship, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what, what you should do with mm -hmm. yourself. Like, I see some videos. I really have to laugh about myself, how I, how I was running over the ice there and was cheering and celebrating like, now I would say I would be a little bit more calm, but as I said, it, it it was unbelievable. It was really unbelievable, and yeah, I I wanted to to make that as experience as soon as possible again because even to win a championship in Mannheim, you have to make that experience like mm -hmm. three days. The city, it's unbelievable. Everywhere you go. Everybody's cheering for you, everybody hugging you. Like it's like you are Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's a similar feeling. Hers hers might be a little more extreme, um, just given her, her world tour right now. But no, that's cool to hear. Obviously, uh, you know, I hope to to feel that, to to experience that down the road here in Mannheim, because obviously, as I mentioned, it's such a great club with a lot of history and um you know, hopefully uh, in the next couple seasons here, we can add a couple more titles, more, a couple more banners to the to the rafters here. Um, another thing you went through, which I think is interesting, is, you know, a couple of years you've been here was when COVID and all that stuff came out. And I know the first year playoffs were canceled, so it was more, you know, just had the season and then you go home, but still, like, guys didn't know, is a league going to start, is it not? And it ends up starting again, and... Obviously, there was no fans there for a while or very limited fans. So I'm just uh, 
want to ask you, like, how was that for, for you? Like, obviously being someone. That has a special effect. Yeah, yeah, we got the special effects in the background. But I was going to say for the, for someone who was a fan before, you know, of the team and not, and knowing that the fans, our fans weren't able to really come to the games and experience it. Like, how was it working? You know, kind of that, I think it was a year and a half without fans or on and off fans. It was kind of weird. So um, also all the stuff around the games, the testing, and it, it was a hard time for us. Um, you weren't allowed to bring your families to the ring. Um, you, you had to, to strictly stay with, with all the, the things that um, the government said to us. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was a tough time and it was also even tough, um, you know, as we mentioned before, like we have really fans here that are diehard fans. They they save over the summer their whole money to to buy a season ticket, and then you go out and some fans were able to come in to bring up their banners in the fan section there to show their support that they are still with us even if they can't be at the rink. And then there were coming some banners up like a hey, rest in peace, and that showed us that a lot of fans. I don't know how to say it right, but they were giving up their life in that time mm -hmm. because hockey is such a big part in their heart. And when they weren't able to come to the rink, like they lost something in their life and they couldn't meet their friends and all that stuff. That made it even tougher, like for me to have still some friendships there and hearing that, like that, that was a really tough time. But also, as I said, for the guys in the locker room, like, when when they always um, push the season back, like you come to the ring, you practice, you practice, and then you get the news, uh, we push back the, mm -hmm. the season start for another three weeks. You go back to the ring, you practice, you practice, you practice. Oh, we are sorry, we can't start. We have to push it back again. Like that was a really, really tough time because we didn't know, does the season start? Does it not start? Like. Yeah, it's it's tough. And then it was so quiet out outside of the rink. Um I mean in one point it was interesting because you could hear what the players are talking on the ice. Uh but yeah, you miss that. You miss that cheering. You miss as probably some players mentioned in before some podcasts, it gives you another push, mm -hmm. especially when you are back like ten minutes to go in the game. You are back three two. And then the whole ring stands up cheering for you. It's getting loud. Like it gives you a push. And um, yeah, you, you miss that in some point. And that was pretty bad and sad also. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned a lot of good things there. I think the one I want to focus on is obviously just kind of the fans there. And, you know, as you mentioned, they save their money every summer. This is something they look forward to every year, um, coming to see these games, supporting their team and obviously not being able to be there because of, uh, such a crazy virus and crazy time we were going through is, you know, kind of felt like a part of them was missing. And I, I definitely feel for them. I'm happy we're through that now. And, um, you know, hopefully we don't have to go through that again. I always tell people it's crazy. Like we, whenever our time ends one day in life, we'll be able to say we lived through a pandemic. That's pretty crazy to think. Um, it feels like it was 10 years ago, but it wasn't so long ago, but, um, Another thing I want to bring up, which I think is pretty cool, um, you're German, yeah, um, and you got to work for the Italian uh, national team there at the World Championships as their video coach. Um, kind of how did how did that opportunity come about? Like, was that something you were you were expecting, or was it just kind of random? And you know, just talk about the overall experience. Yeah, it, it's also um, a pretty funny story. <laughs> Um, so in Germany, it was Mother's Day. It was a Sunday. So at that time, my girlfriend was was out with her mother for brunch. And I was getting a call from, from a good colleague of mine. Um, his name is Flavio Nodari. Maybe some guys know him. Um, he's working for Lugano. And he called me and he said, hey, Flo, um, the guys from the national team called me. If I want to go with the national team, but I can't, I'm working for the IHF refs. Mm -hmm. So I brought you up there. Are you interesting? Uh, are you interested in it? And I said, well, yeah, just give the guy my number. He can call me. 
And then the GM called me and asked me like, yeah, if you want to go. And we set everything up and I was asking him, yeah, uh, when do you have to be where? And he said, well, uh, it would be good if you can be tomorrow morning in Bolzano. And I was like, I don't know how to do that, but I will do it somehow. So I, I was calling it, as I said, at that time, my girlfriend and she took up the phone. I said, well, can you please come home? Like, I have to pack my bags. I have to go to Polsano tomorrow morning. Uh, I go with the Italian national team to the world championships. And it took me really like five times to really get her back home because she thought I'm choking on her. And no, but I did it then. It was also during the Corona season, which made it pretty tough to come down to Bolzano because you had the controls in between mm -hmm. that you have a negative test and all that stuff. And I didn't have one. Like it was really for me going to the train station, buy a ticket to Bolzano, jump on the train. And yeah, it, it was so tough, but it was a funny time. Met, met a lot of good guys there. Um, it went pretty bad for us at the world championships because the, let's say the veteran guys, and that keep the team together, like Thomas Larkin, Andy Bernard, good goalie, um, Alex Trivellato, like, well, or good players in the German league. Like, they were all positive, and it was then so tough. We, mm -hmm. we went there with a really young team, but we still had some some good players there. And yeah, sometimes the luck was missing to to win maybe one game it's still a cool experience. Um, obviously for yourself, you hope that, uh, the team can have success, but, uh, as you said, a couple guys were missing, you had a really young team. So it gave a chance for these young guys to show what they can do, but just a tremendous experience for you to be part of the worlds there. Uh, something obviously to have on your, your resume there, which I think is really awesome. Yeah. And it's also like you go down there and it was funny. We had our locker room and next to our locker room was the Canadian one. And um, across ours was the German one. And it was so funny because our guys from Mannheim didn't know that I was going there. So we went in as Team Italy to our locker room and I was coming in last, having on the track suit of Italy. And all of our, uh, all of our guys were staying there like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I'm here with Team Italy. And it was so funny because we also had the first game against Germany and uh yeah then we the game started and we were leading one nothing and i was sitting up there on my spot like who what am i doing if we really win this game <laughs> like there are probably some thoughts that run through my head i, I mean at the end it was a 9-6 for germany or something like that but it was yeah it, it was the first game of the world championship so you never know especially the underdogs having a good chance there to mm -hmm. make up some points or to grab some points that can be important. And I was really like sitting there. We can't go back to our club locker room if we really win this game. Like it, it was funny. But also an advice if you go there, like meet up, reach out to to the other video coaches of Canada, of the USA. We had Finland, Latvia, probably Germany, I knew. Um yeah, meet up with them, talk. Um and, and reach out, exchange numbers or linked in Twitter or whatever, like just mm -hmm. stay in touch with them. And that was also like a good experience meeting up with guys, like having a small chat with Shane Doan. I never thought like having a talk with a guy like that or like we were at the last place team. So as the last place team, you probably get the smallest uh, locker room at the world championships. Yeah. So I was sitting outside and then Roberto Luongo was saying, was walking by me and I was like, oh, that's Lou. I just know him from the TV. Wow. Like that I experience you made by yourself. Yeah. It's all about networking too, as you mentioned, like make the most of it, introduce yourself to people, just have good quick chats with them. Um, you know, that's how you kind of start building your network there, building your contact list, as you mentioned. Um, speaking of doing that, like just, I wanted to kind of ask you how it's been uh, this year working with, uh, you know, you mentioned there's like Pavel Gross was here before, like a very big name in Germany. But uh, I have to say, uh, you know, in recent years, I don't think there's been bigger names here for coaches in terms of 
uh, in Mannheim other than, you know, Dallas Eakins and obviously Kurt Fraser, two names that are very well known in North America, both guys, you know, play in the NHL of coach in the NHL. I just kind of wanted to ask you for yourself, um, you know, how has it been working with guys like that this year? Like some things that maybe you've learned from them or, um, just kind of experiences like that, that you you'll take away, you know, for the future. It was pretty interesting because, uh, when Dallas came in this season, like I was the guy he talked a lot to because if somebody mentioned that to me a couple of years ago, I, I would say, fuck you are not right in your head, but I'm now the guy in the, in the coach's room that stays here the longest. And so he talked a lot to me and. It's pretty interesting how they see the game, um, on on what they are looking on, how detailed they are going into things like how are the opponent lining up on face-offs, in which direction are the skates showing, and all that detailed stuff. Like before, it was more looking on the system stuff, mm -hmm. what kind of system is the pawn playing, and how do we want to play against that, or how can we um, score on that. And this year, like, yeah, Dallas gave me a lot of self-confidence. Um, he teached me also a lot going in, into deeper into the games, watching the games more detailed. Um, and also like how he split it up the work in the, in the coaches room, giving me the responsibility for doing the five on five free scout, like they do it in the NHL, like giving him a playlist of nine minutes with clips, I think um that could be interesting for us to watch about the opponent what we can do against them which ended also up to to do my first presentation in front of the team up in Bremerhaven where I was really like I don't know if I can say that but shitting my pants like I was so nervous if I would knew that I I would bring three more t-shirts with me to to have a change in between no like it was pretty funny and brought up um, a lot of self-confidence, a lot of more knowledge, also working with, with Kurt day by day, um, which is giving you also a lot of yeah more details and power plays. He was um, responsible for the power play this year in our team. So yeah, looking looking at stuff there, like, as I said, it, it teached me a lot and yeah, brought me probably one step further in, in, mm -hmm. in in my work yeah no for sure um you know anytime you can learn from people i think like that that have obviously seen the highest of the high in terms of levels and had many years doing it and what they've learned and i think the, the coolest thing about both of them and i know you would agree with this is they're both just really easy to talk to and willing to help you i think sometimes in professional sports some people are afraid to share what they know or share what they feel because they're afraid that you know, it could give you an edge against them where with these guys, it's never been about that. It's been about helping everybody at the end of the day, we want the team to succeed. And they, they know that, you know, 10 years from now, if it helps us in our career, great, but it's also not gonna, you know, it's not like a battle or going to affect their jobs either. Right. So I think that's been tremendous to work with them. I've also learned a lot from them, but for yourself, like, you know, you're in there every day for many hours on the bus with them, you know, all those meetings, um, I remember the Bremerhaven meeting. I have to say it was pretty funny because I knew it was happening. And then like, we go into this meeting and close the door and the players are like, uh, where's, where's, where's Dallas. And I'm like, why we're going to do the video now. And they're like, yeah, but like, wh who's, who's doing the meeting. And I'm like, the guy who's sitting behind the computer. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. Like I really prepared like two or three sentences to, to talk before the meeting to the players that they really get settled down to know, okay, he's now running it. And we have to listen to him now. Um, that that was pretty funny. But as I said, I like that was a great feeling to watch the game on the laptop then and to see like they really did what we told them on the video there. Like that's that's kind of a great feeling and it's also kind of a reward for your work. Yeah, it's a, it's a satisfaction. Like you you know that you've given them uh the important information for that game and then you see them go execute execute that that whether it's game plan or tactics and being like hey like i gave them that information now they're doing what i said like this is like fulfilling you know like it means you've yeah. done a good job that day um which i think that's about this business it's it's always 
the end of the day, you want to feel uh, rewarded for all the hard work you've put in. I mentioned Definitely. before, mentioned before you, you are one guy who puts in countless, countless hours, um, staring at a computer screen, uh, getting everything ready, going above and beyond, uh, what you need to do. So, um, as we mentioned, good things happen to good people. Hard work is always rewarded, but, um, kind of transitioning away from hockey. I want to kind of ask you like, what, like, how do you spend, you know, your summers, your off season, like, do you have other hobbies you like to do? Obviously I know, uh, you have a dog. Um, it's always great to spend time with your dog, but is there other things that you, you like doing, do you go traveling? Like how does, how does Florian Kynes kind of spend his off season? Well, not different as the season. Still, um, still in the coach's room, still doing video. Yeah. Right. Like, um, it's right now watching as much games as possible at home, um, watching games from different leagues, especially Europe, um, watching the Swiss league playoffs, watching the Czech league league playoffs, watching the Swedish league, the Finnish league, like you, you, you can get impressions from every league and, um, yeah, you, you don't know who's coming in to the locker room and you, you can always build up a library with a lot of video stuff that can help you in summer, like creating a playbook. So if some, is a, if a coach comes in and says, I want to play like this and this team with that and that system, then you can say, well, I got a couple of clips from, from last year playoffs in Finland. They played a trap pretty good there. So here are a couple of good clips from teams that, that play the trap. Perfect. And then you already got it ready. So it's also, as you probably say, after the season is before the next season. Mm -hmm. You you maybe have, after that loss in Berlin, there were like two or three days where where I was really like down and didn't want to watch any game. And right now it's like the whole day from four o'clock on in the afternoon, they are just running hockey games on my screen. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter. If it's men's hockey, if it's women's hockey, if it's um, junior hockey, just watching hockey. And it's also like teaching yourself more and more, getting, again, more detailed into the game. Mm -hmm. What's interesting? What did I saw there? And then next day you bring it in and talk to the coaches. Like, is it right how I see it there? Or what's your opinion on that? And that's also something that helps you a lot. And once all hockey games are over yeah then you start to do things like coming into the locker room in the morning going to the gym having a bike ride like working out get the dog get out with the dog do some walking and yeah you hope that the summer is going over uh, really fast that the boys are coming back you spend um another great season with a big family that's mm -hmm. that's how i call it because um during the season you spend more time with the guys here in the locker room as with your wife or your girlfriend or whatever at home so um yeah that's for me it's just family in here and so that's why i hope the summer is going over really fast as i mentioned before you bleed the the other colors to an extreme and Sometimes I think you need to mentally take a break from it because it'll help you refresh. But, uh, hey, man, whatever uh, whatever gets you by every day. And, you know, it's good to see that, you know, no matter what, whether it's a season or not, you're staying involved in the game, whether it's watching other teams, driving to places, um, you know, coming to the gym every day just to be here, waiting for some of the guys to come in just to see them. Because as you mentioned, it is a – it is a big family. You know, we have a lot of guys here who fortunately, you know, stay here uh, all year round and also who stay here for a lot of their career. So it's, you know, you build up that relationship with them, both professional and uh, personal, like a friendship, family kind of thing. So um, I'm excited. This is this was my first year here. I had a really good time and we'll see uh, see how it goes here over the summer, because I know on, on Tuesday, for example, when most of the people are gone, I'm going to be like, the hell am I going to do all day? Like, it's, you know, like, it's just like normally part of my job is interacting like with the players in the morning and now they're not going to be here. Um, well, we have some more time on the ice that I can show you my skills. I know we're going on the ice on, uh, on Monday. Flo has told me that he's going to show me, uh, what he's learned over the years. Uh, maybe a Michigan or two. We'll see. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Yeah. De Dallas can film it to show Trevor, uh, how to do it really good. Yeah. There we go. What's up, Loyable too. 
Um, <laughs> another question I have, it's always curious to, to talk to guys about this. Like, what is your ultimate goal in hockey? It depends. Like, there are two goals. There are the goals that I wish to reach with the club, and there are the personal goals. And personally-wise, it's, like, the same as for a player. Like, once you want to work over overseas, working for an NHL team, I know it's pretty tough for a European guy going over there, working there, because there's a lot of going on with relationships. Mm -hmm. You have to know somebody over there that helps you, bringing you in. Um, you you need the contacts there. But also, like for every season, my goal is, or every yeah, every day's goal, personal work, personally wise is to be the best in your job and um, team wise it's it's the same like yeah. you, you you want to be the best team every day in our league probably this year it's not working out but as i said the new season is coming we will be ready for it and um yeah winning a championship that's that's the ultimate goal because you have to make that experience here in Mannheim. you have to make it and yeah, we. I think we will bring in the the right people, and uh, we will have a good chemistry. I was about to say there. Um, no, you mentioned um, kind of like a personal goal for you, and I think one thing that obviously was important about this year, obviously with the with the ups and downs. Um, you know, you got to make some connections there, like people who have good connections in North America, like Dallas and Kurt. So, I'm happy you have those goals. Um. You know, who knows? One day it could definitely happen. I don't think any door is ever fully closed, especially, uh, you know, in this business. And if word travels with, uh, you know, your work ethic, um, what you've been able to do this year, especially for Dallas, like impressing people, I mean. Yeah, but it's not only that. Um, if we go back to the Corona season, for example, um, as I said, it w it was a tough time for everybody. But there was also a thing like I, when I was at home, I, I hung around a lot on Twitter, Facebook and all that stuff. And on Twitter, I met a guy, um, Ian Beckenstein. I hope I said his name right, because in Germany, it's Beckenstein. Um, I think it's Ian Beckenstein. He's the video coach for the Abbotsford Canucks right now. Um, and we made like a Zoom meeting every Tuesday night. And it was pretty funny um, because it grew up a lot. So we met every Tuesday in Germany. It was Tuesday mm -hmm. night. And we were a lot of guys. We were from the AHL, NHL guys, German guys, uh, Swiss league guys, Swedish league guys. And then it started like to have guest video coaches who were presenting stuff. We had a guy from the Detroit Lions NFL. We had um, a coach from a NCAA volleyball team who showed us stuff. I brought in the video guy from Hoffenheim to presenting how they do it in professional soccer. And that was that was a great experience. And still having contact with these mm. guys for exchanges. We have a Discord group where, where we exchange a lot of information. And... There are guys where really friendships were, were going out of. Like, we never met personally, but we're still writing mm -hmm. pretty much every day. And there's a big shout out going out to, to a lot of people that really made it to the NHL. See uh, Emily Netsky in Washington. Like, that's a hell of a road she made, especially as a woman in, in a man-dominated sport. Mm -hmm. um, respect to her. Uh, Cody Ward in San Jose, like winning Calder Cup with Chicago and then getting rewarded to get called up in San Jose. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of guys. I, I could tell now so many names. I, I reached out to and really friendships were coming out of it. That's that's unbelievable. And that that's what makes it all so special. As I said, it's it's more people you know more people you can talk to it's about building that network and then you never know down the road kind of like how it went with you with the italian national team right like something happens they need somebody hey i know this guy in germany doing a great job 
here's a number like you just you never know right and that's why there's always uh you know it's hard to really find a bad uh bad connection you make um a lot of times you know it's they're good ones and you never know what they can lead to but um we've been buzzing here um we got to get ready we have a, a team event tonight but uh, i got two more questions for you um one i'm curious about because you've obviously been on the fan side of it and also the uh management coaching staff side of it part of the team um what do you think makes a championship team obviously as you've mentioned you watch a tremendous amount of hockey whether it's other leagues whether it's doing video work um you watch all our games obviously uh through a little screen downstairs tagging everything you see everything what do you think makes uh makes a championship team that's that's a tough question um i mean if i look back to 1819 when we won the championship last time here in Mannheim, like we had a team that stick stuck together like they were fighting for each guy they were skating for each guy like everybody wanted to make that one step more and as i said it's it's still that all the players are coming together at some road games going out for dinner like that's probably the biggest thing you need for a championship team that you really have a team in the locker room that stands up for each and um yeah then you need uh also the talent like you need the guys that can score the goals mm -hmm. you need the guys um that defend our goal uh you need the guys that can make a hard check that can decide the game and yeah there are so many things but that's probably um a question i would i would ask a manager like for me as i said it's like i i mentioned it in soccer i had that once like we were going out every friday night together as a whole team and if you if you have something like that and you have the right talent also in the locker room that's probably the most important thing no 100 percent uh correct there um i think the camaraderie that kind of family atmosphere as you mentioned before like that goes a long way and um you know obviously there's other variables factors that you need as well um but i think the number one and foremost is being together as a team um if you're not a team you're not going to win so i think that's pretty pretty standard pretty pretty known but it was cool to just kind of hear your opinion um last one for you here i like i like asking all my guests this one to end it um what is one piece of advice or multiple piece of advice you would give your younger self so if you're speaking to florian kynes you know young florian kynes at 16 17 18 years old or maybe also a, a young listener out there who you know his goal one day is to be a video coach in professional sports uh, what is uh, one or multiple pieces of advice you would give them? So I would split that um, because I would never give an advice to my younger self because I'm not a really religious guy, but I think there's a power somewhere that guides us through life and everything happens like it should be. Um, that That's what I believe by myself. But as I said, I'm not really religious mm -hmm. and all that stuff, but that's what I think a everything that happens happens because a power wants it to happen. And yeah, as I said, giving an advice to younger people that want to do that job is just as I had it, like reach out to guys, um, be like a sponge, like get everything, put it in, then have talks or chats with different people in that business doesn't as i say it doesn't matter if it's an nhl guy if it's an ncaa guy if it's a guy in germany in the second league in the third league doesn't matter like everybody is having his opinion about something but everywhere you can take a part out of it and that's probably the the best advice or the best thing you can do if you want to do that job like reach out build up a network for yourself reach out to a couple of, of uh, yeah, video coaches and stay in contact and always be friendly. Like, I know there are some black sheeps outside, but don't be as them. 
like always be friendly always be kindful and then i guess some doors will getting or will open up for you 100 percent agree um you know we mentioned multiple times it's all about who you know connections being friendly to everybody um, and I told you the same thing with your dream there of being in North America. I, I do believe doors will open eventually. Um, you know, as you said, everyone has their own path. Things happen for a reason. So, you know, if you're a video coach at 40 in North America or you're a video coach at 25, that was just kind of your path and how things were meant to be. So I, I agree with you there. Um, Bo, I appreciate you doing this, man. It, it was cool to talk to somebody uh, who's been on both sides of it. And also doesn't come from a traditional, you know, I played for 20 years and then did this. Like, it's cool to hear that because it's, it's something different. Um, and, you know, I'm sure looking back, if you, if you, if I was to talk to your younger self 10 years ago, I don't think you would have said, Hey, I'm going to be the video coach and the DL for one of the most prestigious teams. You know, it's something that your path has taken you there and, you know, now you're making the most of it. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. And if there are some young listeners outside uh, listening to the podcast, um, I just can tell them, like, if you want to reach out to have a little talk, a little chat about the business, about the job, like reaching out on me, I'm probably on every social media platform. We're going we're gonna to you tag can... your, your Instagram in it for sure. So if there's any... Oh, probably not Instagram. That's more private stuff. Okay, so, sorry. Then not... but, but LinkedIn, like Twitter, you can reach out there to me. Florian Kynes on everything um no that's good for anyone who wants to get some tips from from Flo here uh he's always welcoming of that always an easy guy to talk to so i recommend you doing that again Thank Flo, you. thanks thanks for being here for all those listeners give him a follow on everything but instagram because it's too private for him and then uh <laughs> appreciate you guys listening give us a follow and everything go check out these live ones on youtube until next week cheers and ciao <laughs>